Get on the ground! No! They hit that wall so hard, I thought they were going to come through the wall. Dramatic body cam footage shows the brutal tasing of a 75-year-old man in his doorway. The officer involved in the incident has since been charged and fired. The man suffered a stroke and burst appendix after the incident and is now living in a 24-7 care center. Tonight, hospitals starting to feel the strain. The CDC warning the Delta variant is spreading with incredible efficiency. Breakthrough cases on the rise, and the U.S. now averaging more than 37,000 new cases a day. Alabama's governor saying it's time to start blaming the unvaccinated, with new guidance from Louisiana's governor asking residents to mask up. This as New York City's mayor is toying with the idea of requiring vaccine passports at public events. What's next in the race to vaccinate the U.S. Wildfires exploding in the West, firefighters weaving through a wall of flames, the mega drought fueling the infernos as monsoon rains and deadly mudslides sweep through Colorado. The flash flood threat continuing for millions across the West tonight. We have our Ginger Z tracking it all for us. ABC News exclusive country music star Morgan Wallen opening up, sitting down with our Michael Strahan, his first interview since being caught on camera using a racial slur. There's gonna be a lot of people we're gonna watch this interview and say he's only sitting down because he wants to clean up his image. It's all a performance. So what do you say to that? How he says the moment changed him. Going for gold. The Olympic Games now underway in Tokyo. One unlikely team is hoping for a breakout performance. The Nigerian men's basketball team is the only African team at the Games hoping to inspire the next generation of African basketball. I got 10 toes in. I got both arms in. I got my big old head in. Every, every part of my body is in to uplift uh, Nigeria as a country through the game of basketball. Basketball. Could they slam dunk their way to gold? Skateboard superstar, the remarkable 12-year-old, breaking records, becoming the youngest X Games gold medalist. What he says about holding a Guinness World Record, hard work, and meeting his idol. I'm just going to be going to school with this on, basically. Good evening, I'm Andrew Dimbert, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We all hope this would be the summer of fun, a return to normal or something close to it. But the COVID pandemic is now moving in the wrong direction, and even more skeptics are now saying to get the vaccine or mask up. In America's least vaccinated state, Alabama, frustrated Governor Kay Ivey today saying it's time to start blaming the unvaccinated folks. I've done all I know how to do. While hospitals fill up in Kansas City and mask mandates are re reinstated in St. Louis County and Louisiana. A new model now projects the, le the latest Delta fueled surge might not peak until October. And while we're seeing more breakthrough infections of vaccinated Americans, we can't say this statistic enough. More than 99% of U.S. COVID deaths are among the unvaccinated. ABC's Victor Okendo leads us off. Tonight, the Delta surge is pushing some hospitals in hot zones to their limit. In the Kansas City area, doctors say they're running out of beds, and Kansas State health officials are bracing for it to get worse. Everybody needs to think of this as a crisis. We, this is a crisis situation. With the rapid spread of the Delta variant, St. Louis County late today reinstating a mask mandate. And now a new national model predicts the surge in COVID cases may not peak until mid-October, with daily deaths potentially more than tripling what they are now. 38 states and New York City are seeing daily case averages double, triple, or quadruple over the last two weeks. One in five new cases are in Florida. When you see someone under 40 die because of COVID, when there's a vaccine they could have gotten to prevent it, that breaks your heart. Three states, Florida, Missouri, and Texas, accounting for 40% of new cases. In Alabama, the least vaccinated state, a frustrated Governor Kay Ivey not hiding her anger with the unvaccinated, but she won't issue any new restrictions. Folks supposed to have common sense. And, but it's time for to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, not the regular folks. It's the unvaccinated folks that are letting us down. The White House asked whether the administration should take a tougher approach toward the unvaccinated. I don't think our role is to place blame, uh, but what we can do is provide accurate information uh, to people who are not yet vaccinated about the risks they are incurring, not only among, uh, on themselves, but also the people around them. The unvaccinated making up 99% of deaths and 97% of hospitals 
hospitalized patients across the country. In Los Angeles, Stephen Harmon lost his battle with COVID the same day he was put on a ventilator. The 34-year-old was not vaccinated, often joking about the vaccine on social media, even tweeting, I got 99 problems, but a vaccine ain't one. Harmon saying this from his hospital bed, I will not be getting vaccinated once I am discharged and released. In Sacramento, Mia Vinnard regrets she and her husband Brad didn't get the vaccine. She says his dying wish was for others to get the shot. Honey, please go tell our friends to get vaccinated. It's a, it's a real tragedy that this had to happen because we weren't on board by getting vaccinated. Back in Alabama, Derek Duke this week finally decided to get the shot. I've been looking at the news and I've been seeing everybody it's been getting their vaccine and the ones that haven't been getting sick. So I've been thinking about my family and I want them to be well. So I brought them on down and we got our shots and I'm feeling happy. And after the NFL pressured players to get vaccinated or risk forfeiting games and pay, assistant coach Rick Dennison reportedly won't coach for the Minnesota Vikings after choosing not to get a vaccine. The team says they're still holding talks with Dennison. Victor Okendo joins us now from Miami, and Florida is now reporting about 10,000 cases a day, but officials there are saying there's an increase in vaccinations in some of those hard-hit states. Andrew, the White House points to five states with the highest case rates and low vaccination numbers. In the last week, they have seen an increase in their vaccination rates. Those states are Arkansas, Louisiana, Nevada, Missouri, Florida. They saw more people get vaccinated in the last week compared to the national average. Andrew. And Victor, it seems there's been a shift in some of the messaging around vaccinations and COVID restrictions in some of these hard hit communities. Right, and we can start with Governor Kay Ivey, who is downright angry with these people who refuse to get vaccinated. In Tennessee, the top health official there said that the state will resume all forms of outreach after briefly halting it. And even states with higher vaccination rates like New York, they're considering new ways to convince people to get a shot. But the big question is, what will it take for any of this to make a difference? Andrew? Victor Okendo there in Miami. Thank you. Now to the latest on the exploding wildfires out west. More than 80 major fires are burning in 14 states. A new fire in California is forcing evacuations, threatening homes. The dangerous drought conditions are intensifying near those wildfires. Governor Newsom standing in the middle of Folsom Lake Reservoir where you can see smoke from the Dixie Fire in the distance. This as parts of Arizona prepare for monsoon storms this weekend. ABC's Kano Whitworth has more on the weather warnings. Keep driving, baby. You're doing very, very Girls. good. Fawn Smolin says it was like driving through Armageddon, shooting this video as her partner Russell King raced through the flames of the massive bootleg fire in Oregon. We are fleeing. Returning days later. Here's where our house was. There's the water container. This crew fighting the Tamarack fire, escaping a fast moving flare up and that fire still out of control tonight. The flames raging during the worst drought ever recorded. They need rain, but the monsoon storms packing 60 mile an hour winds doing more harm than good. The rain coming too fast to be absorbed by the soil. Deadly flooding in Larimer County, Colorado. Three people still missing. And this all started from a stream that the locals tell me is just some three feet wide and it turned into a 10 foot wall of water full of rocks and trees that destroyed absolutely everything. Families worried their community may never recover. What do you call normal after this? We were spared by the fires you know, twice. And then they have this. Kana Whitworth joins me now from Colorado and authorities say 15 feet of water destroyed five structures, killing a woman and some people are still missing. What's the latest on the search? So Andrew, right now there are three people that are still missing. They have all their crews out there, right? They have hand, dogs, and drones. They're now looking several miles downstream for these people, but they actually had to suspend the search, search today. And really, you can see why when you look behind me, there's just these afternoon rain and thunderstorms that come in. You can almost predict them every single day across the state. And so that search will continue through the weekend. And there's some dangerous weather warnings there. How are officials preparing yeah. for more possible flooding this weekend? 
Yeah, so Andrew, let me tell you that right now in the burn scarred areas across the state, they are currently under the highest threat level possible for flash flooding. And I just want to read you real quickly from the National Weather Service. They said that people live, that live in those areas need to be aware because flash flooding can happen within minutes, so they won't be able to escape. So they're asking everybody to stay alert and leave the area if need be. I mean, this concern is clearly far from over, Andrew. Kano Whitworth, thank you. Those dangerous conditions could impact millions in the West with threatening another round of flash flooding as dozens of uncontained large fires continue to burn. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Andrew. We spent the day on Lake Tahoe and we could barely see the mountains. The mountains behind me here in the valleys of Nevada filling with smoke from the Tamarack fire. That's just one of those 80 plus large uncontained fires. And remember, that one's only 4% contained. It's 50,000 acres. They're trying so hard to get that in, but we're feeling these breezes through the canyons. You see the planes going to fight. It is serious and unfortunately we are not going to get any of that monsoon moisture. Who will get it? Anywhere from Arizona right through the Rio Grande Valley upper middle and lower in New Mexico into Colorado and Utah. I think rounds of rain look really bad for Arizona specifically this weekend. If people there are in a flash flood warning, a warning tells you it's imminent. It's going to happen. And yes, as Kana said, it does happen in minutes. You can get an inch of rain on a burn scar and it can make for incredible debris flows. So watch for that this weekend. And then as we go into the drought, I think it's so important for people to know the U.S. drought monitor has been around for 20 some years. We have never seen this much of the West this high in the levels of drought. Exceptional or extreme at 65%. You can see where the areas that are kind of getting some help from the monsoon. It's going to take a lot more to dent what we've got going here. And finally, I'll leave you with another threat, because why wouldn't I? Uh, now we've got the heat advisories in place from Louisiana right up through Kansas City this weekend, and the numbers, they reflect it. You really feel it. The heat indices will be well above 100, and then, Andrew, that heat moves east early next week. Ginger, thank you. We turn now to Tokyo, where the Olympics are now underway amid heightened concerns over COVID. The opening ceremony taking place with just a small audience and some athletes opting out of the festivities, including Team USA's gymnasts. ABC's James Longman is in Tokyo. Tonight, an evening of celebration and of protests as the Tokyo Olympics gets underway. While tennis star Naomi Osaka lit the Olympic cauldron, marking the official start of the Summer Games, Outside, protesters concerned about holding the games during a pandemic clashed with police. Listen to that. That's the sound of police shouting at protesters. There are quite large crowds of them on this street down here below. We're not allowed to go because we're in the Olympic bubble. But apparently, they can hear these chants inside the stadium. The 68,000 seat stadium had fewer than a thousand guests, most of them foreign dignitaries. A $1.5 billion arena welcoming athletes from some 200 competing countries. And among those there, First Lady Jill Biden. Only a third of Team USA appearing. Flag bearers Sue Bird from the WNBA and baseball's Eddie Alvarez leading the US delegation. But notably absent the women's soccer team and Team USA gymnasts, including Simone Biles, who held their own ceremony at the hotel outside the Olympic Village. On social media, Biles pointing to COVID concerns. The pandemic looming large over the day's excitement, with 19 more COVID cases linked to the Olympics reported, bringing the total to at least 110. And all night outside the stadium, the streets filled with Japanese citizens carrying signs saying, cancel the Olympics. Protesters furious as new COVID cases have risen in Tokyo ahead of the Games. But earlier today, the executive director at the IOC telling our Amy Roback he's confident with where things stand despite the opposition. Is there a scenario in which these games could be canceled? There's no scenario in which they can be canceled. James Longman joins me now. James, a very different start to the Olympics. Just give us a sense of how prominent these protests were as the opening ceremonies were taking place. Well, Andrew, from where we were standing, pretty prominent. We were on a street about, I'd say, 400 yards away from 
the stadium and down below on the street below which by the way was supposed to be empty the authorities here had said to people stay home watch this on television don't come out they didn't want protests but they also didn't want covid to be spreading amongst uh, people in the street i mean normally in an olympic opening ceremony every single street in tokyo would have been packed with party goers so they wanted people to stay home we looked down and there were large crowds of people assembling towards the end of our street and then huge numbers of police, I mean, police car after police car, police truck, and then both groups with loudspeakers chanting at one another about what they think uh, should be happening. Protesters angry that this is uh, continuing during a pandemic. Worried about the health issues that all these foreign athletes coming into their city, which is still under a state of emergency, represent. But also, I think, upset that um, they've been made to feel disenfranchised, that somehow these Olympics are happening without Japan really wanting them to, that the country has been forced to put these Olympics on and I think people here have as they have been doing over the last two weeks want to make their voices heard the opening ceremony was the moment for them to do it and they're going to continue to do it I think we're going to see protests over the over the next three weeks Andrew James Longman there in Tokyo thank you if you need to leave the country and need a passport heads up the backlog is out of control this was the scene in the Los Angeles passport office. Some in line say they submitted their application this spring. ABC's Mary Alice Parks joins us now from Washington and today the State Department data showed just how bad this backlog is. Yeah, Andrew, new State Department data obtained by ABC shows that the new backlog is over 2.1 million. So this issue is even worse than we thought. The State Department says that staff is back in person in those regional offices, but the reality is they're not all back in person every day. There's still a lot of COVID protocols and social distancing taking place in those regional offices, and that's adding to this, when right now so many Americans are looking to travel again and get their passports renewed. Now, regardless of those pictures we just saw from California, the majority of passport renewals are submitted by the mail. And right now, the State Department is giving people a heads up that that process can take up to five months. Andrew? So any tips to get a passport faster? <laughs> Well, if you're traveling within three days, you can try to get an emergency appointment, but those are limited and they're normally reserved for, for real emergencies. So really, I say look at your passport and if it's set to expire in the next six months or the next year, try to get going on this process now. Andrew. Right. Good advice there. Thank you to Mary Alice Parks. And if you or anyone you know is looking for a car, new or old, you know that demand is high. Some owners are selling their new cars back to dealers at a profit, while some used cars are being sold for as much as 45% more this year than last year. ABC's Ariel Reshef has more. Tonight, the new reality for Americans looking to buy a car. Dealerships with new cars sold before they even arrive on the lot. The prices of used cars soaring. And it turns out, in some cases, car owners selling their cars back to the dealership for a profit. Brian Walsh is a car salesman in Scranton. We've never seen anything like this before. So what's driving this? Computer chips crucial for many new cars are now in short supply. Production slowed down by the pandemic, leaving dealerships across the country with low inventory. Many of those dealers now looking to find used cars to sell. Used cars in high demand and prices on the rise too. In some places, the cost of a used car up 45% over the last year. In Paramus, New Jersey, sales director Matthew Jelling says he's been watching what's happening with used cars in awe. Are dealerships now more keen to buy used cars because you need inventory? Oh, without a doubt. They always said you, you lose 30% of your value the minute you walk up the floor. It's not that way now. Franco Dokai owns a car detailing business in St. Louis. He says this summer he's made $15,000 selling used cars back to dealers. I can't believe for once I'm leaving the car dealership with money in my pocket. Wesley Kistner is looking to buy a new truck in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And he says several dealerships have offered him top dollar for his 2018 Nissan Titan. That's the first thing they ask me is they want to buy it. I like new cars, but at the moment, they're not available. And Jelling says in many cases, cars haven't even arrived yet, and they've already sold. If you see cars coming off of a truck, chances are those 10 cars have been sold. <laughs> and car dealers we talked to say they expect this supply chain issue to last through the end of 2022, and with all that pent-up demand, it could make the wait even longer. 
Ariel Reshef, thank you. And new record highs on the stock market today. The Dow Jones average up 238 points, closing above 35,000 for the first time. The Nasdaq and S&P also hitting new records with strong earnings reports from major companies crowding out concerns about the Delta variant that moved the market lower to start the week. And when we come back, the three-month-old baby girl found alive under a building that collapsed from deadly floods. The arson investigation underway. Did somebody try to burn down one of Beyonce and Jay-Z's homes? But up next, he is one of the biggest stars in all of music, despite being pulled off the airwaves for saying the N-word. Our exclusive interview with Morgan Waller. You'll hear his apology next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Mario Batali and his former business partner are settling the sexual harassment and discrimination claims against them. New York's attorney general announced they agreed to pay $600,000. At least 20 former employees accused the celebrity chef and at least 20 former employees of a pattern of harassment at three of his restaurants. He previously apologized and divested from the company company. Country music star Morgan Wallen is speaking out for the first time since he was caught on camera using a racial slur back in February and our Michael Strahan got to sit down with him one on one. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to watch this interview and say he's only sitting down because he wants to clean up his image. It's all a performance. So what do you say to that? I understand that, you know, I understand that, that I'm not ever going to make you know, everyone happy. I can only come tell my truth, and, and that's all I know to do. 28-year-old country music star Morgan Wallen quickly rose to fame with his five-time multi-platinum chart-topping hit, Whiskey Glasses. I'm gonna need some whiskey glasses. The single cementing his place in country music and his latest album, Dangerous, released in January, is the highest-selling and streaming album in all of music in the U.S. this year. Seven summers ago. But in January, neighbors recorded this video obtained by TMZ showing Wallen using a racial slur outside his Nashville home. 
The music world responded swiftly. Within hours, Wallen was suspended from his label, his songs pulled from the radio and streaming playlists, and he was declared ineligible for the upcoming Academy of Country Music Awards. When did you realize that what you had done was a big deal? My manager called me probably two hours before before the video came out. You know, he's like, are you sitting down? And, and no one's ever called me and said that before. I went to one of my friends has a house, you know, out in the, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, just sitting in that, sitting in that house trying to figure out what it is I'm supposed to do. So, so take me back to that night. I had some, some of my, you know, longtime friends in town. You know, we'd kind of just been partying all weekend and we figured we'd just go hard for the two or three days that they were there. How did this happen? Out of nowhere, you just refer to someone with a racial slur? No, I, I, I don't think it was just, it just happened. You know, I was around some of my friends and, and you know, we just, we stay, we stay dumb stuff together. It was, in our minds, it's playful, you know? I don't, I don't know if that's, that sounds ignorant, but it, that's really where it came from. And, and, it's, and it's wrong. And had there been no video of the incident, we obviously wouldn't be sitting here right now. This is not the first time you said the word. This is the word that you use frequently amongst your friends. I wouldn't say frequently, no, no, not, not frequently. It was just around this certain group of friends, I would say. In what way was it used? You know, it's one of my best friends. He would, we were all clearly drunk, and I was asking his girlfriend to, to take care of him because he was drunk and he was leaving. I didn't mean it any, in any derogatory manner at all. There are a lot of people gonna say, okay, we've been drunk, we never used the word. Um, even when you're drunk, there are certain things you do and you don't do. What made you think that the word was ever appropriate to use? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, think I, I think I was just ignorant about it. I don't think I sat down and was like, hey, is this right or is this wrong? And do you know the history of the word? Oh, yeah. I've heard some stories in the, in the initial conversations that I had after that, just how, just how some people are you know, treated even still today. And I'm just like, I haven't seen that with my eyes, that pain or that, or that insignificant feeling or whatever it is that, that it makes you feel. That, that goes back to slavery used by white people to dehumanize Black people make them feel less than. It's, exactly. al it's also, I think if you dig deeper, a word that a lot, of, a lot of black people heard before they were terrorized, beaten, or even possibly killed. So it's a word that really, um, I've been called it, um, makes you mad, makes you angry, doesn't make you feel um, good at all. So do you understand why it makes black people so upset? I don't know how to put myself in their shoes because I'm not, you know, but I, I, I do understand, especially when I, when I say that I'm using it playfully or whatever, ignorantly, I understand that that must sound, you know, like he doesn't, he doesn't understand. More than a week after Waller was caught on camera using a racial slur, he posted this video apologizing and asking his fans not to defend his actions. I also accepted some invitations from some amazing black organizations, some executives and, and leaders to engage in some some very real and honest conversations. Who do you speak with? BMAC is one of the first organizations that I spoke with, uh, the Black Music Action Coalition. I spoke with Kevin Lyles, I spoke with Eric Hutcherson, with B.B. Winans is another one that I, that I spoke with. I went and checked myself into rehab. And for, for 30 days, I spent some time out in San Diego, California. Um, you know, just trying to figure it out. Why, why am I acting this way? Do I have an alcohol problem? Do I have a, a deeper issue? In the nine days following the release of the video, downloads of Wallen's album skyrocketed by 500%. And that album has spent 24 weeks at number one on the top country album charts. Before this incident, my, my album was already doing well. It was already being well received by critics and by fans. Me and my team noticed that whenever this, this whole incident happened, that there was a spike in my sales. So we tried to, to calculate what the number of how much it actually spiked, you know, from this incident. And we got to a number somewhere around $500,000 and we decided to, do to donate that money to, to some organizations, BMAC being the first one. ABC News reached out to BMAC, but has not heard back. For some black country music artists, this controversy highlighted the racial disparities within the industry. In the land of the free, you should try to be black like me. The first black female country singer to be nominated for a Grammy, Mickey Guyton tweeting, when I read comments saying that this is not who we are, 
I laugh because this is exactly who country music is. I question on a daily basis as to why I continue to fight to be in an industry that seems to hate me so much. So do you believe there is a race problem in country music overall? I mean, it, 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 would, it would seem that way, yeah. You know, I haven't really, I haven't really sat and thought about that. Still ahead here on Prime, a major update in that exhausting, heartbreaking effort in Surfside after that building collapsed. The tense moments while the assassinated Haitian president is laid to rest and why women may soon be eligible for a military draft. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Take a listen. Because this is a city we love and the game we believe in. And together, we are all Cleveland Guardians. The Cleveland Guardians coming to a baseball stadium near you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now to a major change in an annual defense bill approved by a Senate committee this week. If it passes for the first time in our nation's history, women could be drafted into the military if there's a national emergency. And here's what that means by the numbers. Since 1973, we've had an all-volunteer military. Our last draft was during the Vietnam War. But even today, almost all men aged 18 to 25 who are U.S. citizens or immigrants living in the U.S. are required to register with the Selective Service in case a draft becomes necessary. Now, a new bill would require the same of women. The Senate nearly passed something similar in 2017, but instead created a national commission to study the issue. The commission concluded that women should be called to serve and that it's, quote, a necessary and fair step, making it possible to draw on the talent of a unified nation in a time of national emergency. Of course, women are already serving at all levels of the U.S. military, and in 2013, the Pentagon removed the ban on women in combat roles. This week's bipartisan bill passed 23 to 3 by the Senate Armed Services Committee and congressional aides say it's very likely to become law. 
And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. Some were stunned when Team USA recently lost an exhibition basketball game to Nigeria. We weren't because we were closely tracking the rise of the sport inside Africa, and we'll bring you our report. The website allowing those with pools to rent it out. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. News now and America this morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? You don't. I was gonna say. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead? ABC World News now and America this morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. What don't you know about one of the most infamous crimes? They have no idea what's in store for them. To play out on the open ocean. They handcuffed them to the anchor. There's really no other word to describe it. It's evil. The 2020 event, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. The cries for more people to get their COVID-19 shots growing louder, with the U.S. now averaging more than 40,000 new cases a day, up 251% since June. Alabama is the least vaccinated state in the entire country. It's time for to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, not the regular folks. It's the unvaccinated folks that are letting us die. And now a new national model predicts the surge in COVID cases may not peak until mid-October, with daily deaths potentially more than tripling what they are now. 38 states and New York City are seeing daily case averages double, triple, or quadruple over the last two weeks. One in five new cases are in Florida. This, as New York City's mayor, is toying with the idea of requiring vaccine passports at public events. We tried purely voluntary for, you know, over half a year. We tried every form of incentive. So we have reached the limits of a purely voluntary system. It's time for more mandates. The exhausting, heartbreaking search for victims of the deadly building collapse in Surfside, Florida, coming to an end. One month after Chamberlain Towers South came down, Florida Task Force 2 left the site today. 97 victims recovered, at least one person still missing. Firefighters returning to their headquarters this afternoon with family members waiting and cheering. Miami-Dade's mayor thanking them for their dedication. You have shown the world what superheroes look like. Firefighters saluted for working 12-hour shifts while camping at the site. 
Oh, vamos! In Haiti, reports of gunfire and tear gas near the funeral of slain President Jovenel Moise. U.S. diplomats leaving early. The White House says they're safe. Surrounded by heavy security, Moise's widow, the former first lady, addressed the mourners with agitated supporters outside and protests across the country. Hopes that Haiti would unite after the president's assassination have dimmed, though a new prime minister is now in place. With catastrophic flooding in central China leaving many searching for loved ones, a moment of hope. <laughs> Search teams rescue this three-month-old baby girl from under the debris of a collapsed building. The child had been missing for over a day. Chinese media reports floodwaters trapped both the baby and its mother in the building. The mother sadly dying. The baby is in stable condition. With nearly a week of flooding, officials have raised the death toll to over 33 people. Wednesday night's fire at a mansion owned by Beyonce and Jay-Z now being investigated as arson. Authorities in New Orleans believe the fire began in the kitchen where they reportedly found a gas can along with books inside the oven. I was walking around the corner with Ziggy Smalls and uh, all the all the smoke was coming out. Witnesses say a man was seen running from the mansion when the fire broke out. Authorities have not disclosed how much damage the home sustained, but it took 22 firefighters to extinguish the fire. Records show Beyonce's management company bought the mansion in 2015 for $2.6 million. Originally, the building was a church and then a ballet school. Neighbors say few, if any, people have entered the mansion in years, although they say a gate was unlocked, allowing people to access the property. The city's fire Fire department says the building has been vacant for some time. Side running layup, it's good and a foul! Another big record for LeBron James. That's right, he's now the first person to become a billionaire while still playing in the NBA. You want to play me in basketball? Much of that income was earned off the court with investments and endorsements. Okay, we got a note here that Michael Jordan is a billionaire, but he didn't reach that threshold until after he stopped playing. And we go back now to Tokyo, where the upstart Nigerian men's basketball team is hoping to make waves. The only team in the Olympics from Africa. They shocked the powerhouse team USA in an exhibition game ahead of the Olympics. A sign of growth of basketball in Nigeria, which has eight NBA players on its Olympics roster. So can they shock the world again? Here's ABC's Kenneth Moten. It was the most lopsided loss in Olympic basketball history. Team USA defeating Nigeria back in 2012 by a stunning 83 points. The final score, 156 to 73. So I was a kid, I remember that game, and it wasn't nice, it wasn't good, seeing how bad we got beat. But fast forward just nine short years in Nigeria's revenge. Team USA Basketball defeated for the first time by a team from Africa, 90 to 87 in exhibition play this month. They call us the kings of Africa right now. And with that three-point loss, what once seemed unthinkable may have appeared obtainable to Olympic teams worldwide. No question about how talented they are. They can be beat. It is doable. The rest of the world is catching up. For a team that has won 15 out of a possible 18 total gold medals in men's basketball at the Olympics, and six out of seven since the pros were allowed to play starting in 1992, a crack in the armor of a basketball juggernaut, bringing flashbacks of the 2004 Olympics when Team USA received the bronze in basketball. This game will go down in the annals. But USA losing not one, but two exhibition games in a row this summer, Nigeria then Australia, nearly unimaginable. Imaginable. There were a lot of people who were shocked. Uh, were you surprised by that result and what happened? No. Uh, over half that team has NCAA or NBA experience. And so the knock on, on African teams in international competition was their lack of shooting ability. But if you remember, Team Nigeria hit 23s on the U.S. team. Former NBA player and college basketball analyst Stephen Bardo created basketball clinics in Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal. He says the game is growing by leaps and bounds in Africa. College coaches already on the lookout for African standouts. He said, listen, you know, if you come across some guys, man, let me know because I can tell the coaching staff that happened four or five times when I was over there. 
Africa is seen as fertile ground for basketball talent. The NBA this year launching the 12-team Basketball Africa League to grow the game on the continent. Like Team USA, the Nigerian basketball team was only assembled a couple of weeks ago. But NBA legend Dikembe Mutombo says this is the best African team he's ever seen. Nigeria is just a piece of the puzzle. What is about to come? Part of a narrowing talent gap between the United States and the rest of the world. Nigeria is going to rule basketball here in the next 15, 10, 15 years. They're going to rule basketball in the world. That's a strong statement. You see, I didn't hesitate. Now, I, I, I played 10 years of pro ball, played overseas, played in the NBA. It's just a matter of time. Today, global superstars, both from Africa and Europe, are dominating. From Cameroon's Joel Embiid and Pascal Siakam to Slovenia's Luka Doncic, Serbia's Nikolai Jokic, and new NBA champion Giannis Antetokounmpo of Greece, whose parents are from Nigeria. I would claim Giannis has been one of us because he was from the blood of the African men and women. Many of the players on Team Nigeria are Americans with family roots in Nigeria. But these players see themselves inspiring the next generation of African basketball. I think what also was important about our game against the U.S. is that you know, hopefully it brings a lot of attention to us from younger athletes that are Nigerian that may be interested in being a part of Nigeria basketball now. The Miami Heat's Precious Achua grew up in Nigeria and didn't start playing basketball until he came to the U.S. when he was 13. More focus should be put towards places like, you know, Nigeria and other African countries uh, for a search of talent and giving the kids back home opportunity to be able to develop their skills. They're fighting like heck to be known as very good players in the NBA and around the world. That fight will soon play out in the Olympics. There's still factors holding back basketball in Africa. Veteran NBA coach Mike Brown is not of Nigerian descent, but he agreed to run the Nigerian national team without pay. The sky's the limit. The talent is there, the athleticism, the size, all that is there to get better coaching, better teaching from when the guys are this big to, uh, you know, to their growth uh, of, of adults would be, be one of the biggest things. Many countries there also struggle with violent conflict and political turmoil. If there's not enough stability, it's hard to do, to do infrastructure work. It's hard to develop playgrounds. It's hard to develop gyms. Nigeria, too, has seen violence and mass kidnappings like the ones by Boko Haram in 2014 and again in the past year. Despite its challenges, Team Nigeria will soon be competing in Tokyo. Cheer us on and uh, go get your Nigerian basketball T-shirt, baby, because the Olympics is right around the corner. Team USA is still the favorite for the gold with their exhibition losses likely serving as a wake-up call before Olympic competition. We all fought so hard to make sure that uh, we open that door for the next generation to come. The U.S. beating somebody by eight is not going to be there no more. I don't think it ever going to happen again. But teams like Spain, France, Australia, and even Nigeria could soon close the gap. You know, I don't think there's any uh, one or two countries that will dominate something like the Olympics forever. You know, I think it's only a matter of time that uh, Africa itself will step up. The core of our team are pretty young. Um, so if we can start now and continue to build a culture, I know we'll be um, successful for years to come. Coach Mike Brown is all in. I got 10 toes in. I got both arms in. I got my big old head in. Every, every part of my body is in to uplift uh, Nigeria as a country through the game of basketball. I'm joined now by Kenneth Moten from Tokyo. Kenneth, you mentioned that Team USA is still the favorite for gold, but they do face some uphill challenges as these games begin. They do, and I remember you're a Miami Heat fan, Andrew, so you know a little bit about this. After those two exhibition losses, Team USA is not coming into the Olympics as an unbeatable powerhouse. They've lost several players to injury and positive COVID tests, and they've had very little time to play together compared to other squads. Remember, three of the players are getting here this weekend after competing in the NBA Finals this week. Devin Booker of the Suns playing against the Bucks, Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton. But now they're all Team USA. 
Yes, they're some of the best players in the world, but there could still be some hiccups on that road to goal after a very long NBA season, Andrew. That's right. The Nigerian team has two Miami Heat players on their roster. And back to today's opening ceremonies, you were one of the few inside the stadium. Just tell us about what kind of experience it was in person. Well, first, Andrew, it was an honor to be there to witness a historic Olympic, a global event. Uh, but I will say that a 5,000 spectator group there for a 70,000 seat venue, uh, it was a little odd, especially when you think it's the Olympics. But I will also say that the show was great. It was colorful, it was beautifully stunning uh, and beautifully displayed the Japanese culture. But it was just sad that the Japanese people who paid for these games could not be there, that foreign spectators could not be there to see it. Uh, also, those protests that were happening outside, we could hear them inside because of the empty stadium. But it was incredible to see the resiliency when those athletes who've been through so much and sacrificed so much paraded in. Andrew. Kenneth Moten from Tokyo. Thank you. Now to what's being called the Airbnb for Backyard Pools, a new app helping people find a place to cool down in the summer while homeowners, yeah, they're cashing in. ABC's Will Reeve has more. As temperatures soar and people look for ways to see family and friends outdoors, a new trend taking off. Think Airbnb, but for pools. And within just a couple hours, I had three bookings. Jim Batten, who lives in Portland, Oregon, began using the app Swimply last September. He says he's now on track to make more than $100,000 by the end of the year. I was the top pool in the country out of 13,000 pools uh, for several months this year. And I thought I would probably earn $500 to $1,000 a month, but it's more like lately about $12,000 a month. Founder Bunim Laskin says he was inspired to create Swimply while trying to find activities for his large family without spending big bucks. Around 70% of our users are families that are just looking for a quiet place to relax with their family and the people they love. You simply open up the app, you find pools nearby. Tens of thousands of users around the country are actively buying swim time on the Swimply platform. And according to Swimply, the number of hosts have jumped 435% during the pandemic. Each booking comes with insurance for the host and guests must sign a waiver. But before you sign up, insurance agents warn you should read the fine print. If you rent out your pool, you could be on the hook for any damage. It's a lot for the homeowner to manage. They want to make a profit. They have the pool, but they're doing so at great odds. If they can take a chance, but I don't recommend it. And when we come back, meet the 12-year-old taking the skateboarding world by storm. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. What don't you know about one of the most infamous crimes? They have no idea what's in store for them. To play out on the open ocean. They handcuff them to the anchor. There's really no other word to describe it. It's evil. The 2020 event, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. I can tell you that I'm not a person who wants to die. I'm not the strongest every day, but I'm not the weakest either. And I won't break. Whitney Houston, she had the ingredients. Just pow. She was the queen. A crown was given to her, and crowns are heavy. You think it's easy being a superstar? You have no idea. Superstar Whitney Houston. Wednesday night, August 11th on ABC and streaming on Hulu. When I started my journey, I wanted to teach people that it's no such thing as a bad dog. From the leader of the pack. She won't listen to me. Today's a new day. 
claim your space. Comes a serene new series. She has forgotten how to be a dog. No more excuses. It's now or never. Discover tranquility through training. I need you to be calm and confident. It's amazing. You did good. Season Milan, better human, better dog. New series Friday, July 30th at 9 on National Geographic. This is what being live is Freeze all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now to a remarkable story of a young skateboarding prodigy. Just take a look. Incredible. This is Guy Curry, and it is a pleasure speaking with you tonight. First off, congratulations on your monumental triumph. You're very impressive. Uh, take us back to the moment when you competed against your childhood idol. We're talking about pro skater and legend Tony Hawk. But you also won. So what was that feeling like? Um, honestly, just the best feeling in the world. And I love doing what I do. It's the best, in my opinion. And after your grand win, you posted on Instagram, I'm super stoked, no words to explain my feelings, speechless. Now you have clearly worked extremely hard for this moment. Why did you start skateboarding and who is your motivation? My motivation is Tony Hawk and mostly my dad because he's the one that started it all for me in general. And for our viewers who are unfamiliar with the Skateboarding X Games, you nailed a 1080, which is a skateboarding trick where you perform three full rotations in the air. Walk us through the training process for this incredible feat here. How many hours did it take you to master this skill before you finally landed it? Um, this trick felt like forever. So maybe about hundreds to thousands of hours. Did you start with the 900 first and then sort of work your way up to 1080? Yeah, I I landed the 900 when I was like eight. Then after, in that short span, I was just thinking about the 1080, just joking it around with my friends until I actually got to try it. So we're talking about this incredible trick. You also win a gold medal at the X Games. You beat Tony Hawk and you're only 12 years old. So how do you balance winning titles, attending practice, going to school, and then also having a normal childhood all at once? Oh, um, I wanna say it's great. My life is perfect. That's a great answer there. And lastly, Guy, you certainly are not new to breaking records. You also hold the title for being the youngest person to land a 900, as we mentioned. You did it at just eight years old. The youngest person to compete at the X Games at the age of 10. And last year, you were awarded two Guinness World Records, and you also beat Tony Hawk. I mean, what is next for you? Where do you go from here? Oh, no, I'm, now I'm just dreaming about the 1260. I've been thinking about a lot late, a lot lately, and it's gonna come shortly. And Guy, what do you do with that X Games gold medal? Where is it now? Where are you gonna keep it? Um, I have it. It's right here. It's it's really fragile, and for me, it's perfect. I love it. Have you taken it to school? Show your friends yet? Uh, for now, I'm I'm in summer break, but when I get back. I'm just gonna be going to school with this on, basically. Well, Guy, we wish you all the best. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to the rest of your career. Thank you so much. And next, it's called one of the biggest antique destinations in the world, and it is becoming increasingly popular with millennials and younger Americans. Lara Spencer has more. Broomfield is back. Thank God. It's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> this shopper's paradise in western Massachusetts has been shut down for nearly two years. But this week, it's back with a vengeance. This is just proof positive that you can find anything in Brimfield. Have we moved on from the pandemic? Oh, I think so, yeah. 
America's largest flea market, open for just one week shopathons in May, June, and September, attracting 50,000 visitors a day and has become hot for young shoppers like Madison. Why flea market over online shopping? It's nice to get something you feel like has a story and a little bit of mud on the tires and yeah also I feel a little history yeah i feel better about not putting like more into the world so you guys are moving to san diego we are and shopping for your new home at the flea market yes we are what are you looking for um we're from connecticut so we're looking to bring that new england feel with us all the way to california oh that's so nice right and the fact that everybody in each tent in each booth knows exactly what it is and where it came from and yeah. how it was created and who owned it before is is really cool so it's really cool i would rather come here and keep that history alive than go shopping somewhere else. So whether you've come to Brimfield just to take it all in or have flown nearly 2,000 miles for a bargain. We flew here from Texas to shop for all sorts of things. Honestly, when we made our reservations for all this, we didn't even know if it was going to happen because everything was still shut down. When it came to fruition, it was just so exciting. This flea market extraordinaire has a little something for everyone. Why did you decide to buy saws here? Well, because I saw them, and I recently started taking up woodworking, and why not? They're beautiful. How old are they? These are early 1900s. Beautiful. And then some mid-century art? Mid-century art attracted to the frame. <laughs> totally. Of all things, yes. totally, from far away. And then the guy said, all three for 50 bucks, and I threw my wallet out and <laughs> said, take everything. Yes. So I had to. Our thanks to Lara. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Look, it's Friday night. Let's all take a deep breath, lean back, and whew, exhale like this panda in France who is eating bamboo and living his best life. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Andrew Dimbert. Thanks for streaming with us. Strickland on his 62nd birthday. Let me start by saying happy birthday to you. Any thoughts in particular on this day with regard to, to spending another day, another year here? I was determined to spend this birthday awake as long as I could. You know, uh, never know if this is going to be the last one. This is the 43rd birthday he spent behind bars. I would like to get a sense of what it does to, to someone to be behind bars for 43 years. I think I've been destroyed. What he calls his destruction is not just the result of decades in prison, it's decades in prison for a crime he says he didn't commit. In fact, the same prosecutor's office that tried him for a 1978 triple murder has since determined he's innocent. So to Mr. Strickland, I am profoundly sorry for the harm um, that has come to you. That was more than a month ago, and yet here Mr. Strickland sits, what he calls preparing for the grave. I turned 62 today, and uh, I just don't feel I got a lot of time left. I've experienced a couple of heart attacks. I got high blood pressure. Uh, my ability to stand is diminished. And yet people are now standing up for Strickland, who's now wheelchair bound. The Midwest Innocence Project took on his case three years ago. I think here when there's not a question of innocence and where the prosecutor and other authority figures agree that he should come home, I would certainly hope that our elected officials would give it a really hard and quick look. More than a dozen state lawmakers are now calling on Missouri Governor Mike Parson to pardon Strickland. Among them, the Republican chair of the state's House committee that oversees their prison system. So now that we've gotten to this point, I'm just curious why Mr. Strickland is still behind bars. Boy, that's a hard, um, that's a hard reality. Um, the, the only thing I can tell you about that, um, 
slightly in defense of this system is that it believes in finality. That finality came for Kevin Strickland in 1979, following his arrest a year earlier for the gruesome triple homicide of Larry Ingram, John Walker, and Sherry Black. Police arriving at this Kansas City home found blood-stained sheets, trash-covered floors, concerned neighbors looking at investigators in horror. That night is seared in Strickland's memory. April 25th, 1978, 9.30 p.m., it was a Tuesday. Do you remember what you were doing? Yes, I know exactly what I was doing. I was at home, I was, I think I was watching uh, Three's Company and uh, on and off the telephone. Relatives confirmed his alibi at the time. So at what point do police come to you and start accusing you of, of this triple murder? The next morning. And you are thinking? This, this can't be happening. The crime shook the local community. While Strickland was in custody charged with the murders, two other suspects, Kilm Atkins and Vincent Bell, were on the run.